can go ahead and start. People are coming over ready, right? Yeah, I like to throw her music. Right. Lift up your gaze, be lifted up. Tell everyone how great the love. The love come down from heaven's gate. To kiss the earth with hope and grace. Sing, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands, be lifted up. Let the redeemed declare His love, and we bow down at heaven's gate to kiss the feet of hope and grace. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who is this King of glory? The Lord. LCR. Obviously, we look a little different today, but we're strong and mighty just the same. I'm going to share with you from 2 Corinthians. Since then, we have such a hope. We act with great boldness. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another. Now, when I was preparing this week, I was trying to figure out what all of the verses had in common with each other. And sometimes that's a little bit of a struggle for me. Um, they don't seem to kind of fit. And, and so I talked to Pastor Pike, and what he shared with me was that this week, above all others, is about seeing Jesus clearly for who he is. And so as we begin our worship and continue with our worship this morning, my, my hope for you is that you will, you will focus clearly on who Jesus is this morning and then as we go into our week. turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. Not like you. In 
into the darkness to shine. Out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. God. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, oh God, our God. And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? Then what can stand against? Our God is greater. Stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've chased sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you
this morning. Heavenly Father, there is so much to lift up to you this morning. There is so much uncertainty in the world, Lord, and a lot of fears and anxieties on this beautiful Sunday morning. I lift those up to you, Lord. I also just am so grateful that ultimately you are in control and you are in charge of all that happens, Lord, and that we can put our trust and our faith in you. The Holy Spirit is mightily welcomed in this place this morning, Lord. I ask that it moves mightily amongst us and that it brings to us all that you want us to hear. I lift all of this up to you and I just ask for your blessings on Pastor Pike's words and your blessings on each of us as we move out into our week. I ask all of this in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat.
Today's reading is from the 34th chapter of Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that a skin on his face shone because he had been talking to God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin on his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them a commandment of all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put on a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord and came to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out, he told the Israelites of what he had been commanded. The Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin on his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went to speak with him. This ends 
the word of the Lord. Please stand if you are able. This is a gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. Now about eight days after those sayings, Jesus took with him Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance on his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they stayed awake all night, they saw his glory and the two men who spoke with him. As they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said, while he was saying this, a cloud came over and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the, the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent. And in those days, told no one of what they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd had met him. Just when a man came down from the crowd and shouted, Teacher, I beg of you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and at once he shrieks. He convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I beg your disciples to cast out, but they could not. Jesus answered, your faithlessness and persevered generation. How much longer must I be with you and bear it with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming down, a demon dashed in him and dashed him to the ground in convolutions. But Jesus revoked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all astounded with the greatness of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, we're glad everyone's here this morning. It's going to be quite a busy week at LCR. So today, actually, you could go to Newport Rib for uh, Robin's Nest eating out. So you'd get a good meal and support a good cause. And that's going to begin our Lenten support. And some of you have already brought chili and macaroni and other stuff there in the back that we'll be collecting. Um, also, uh, tomorrow, we'll be at St. Simon and Jude in their gym to also talk about Robin's Nest. So we're going to have a busy uh, week, and we hope that you'll be able to join us as we kind of lean more deeply into what it means to support at-risk teens in our community. And then Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Thursday, we're having our Zoom with Japan that we push back a week. Um, Saturday, the Rotary Club will be here with wine tasting, and you can talk to Pete and Lori out on the patio. They have a table. And then Sunday is one service because it's Startup Lutheran Schools Week. So almost every day you could be here. Um, doing something fun and interesting. And um, we're just grateful for everything that's happening as we head up to 
um, Lent. And we'll talk more about that a little bit, the significance of this season uh, coming up. If you listen to the readings this morning and what Mike just read, we had talk of Moses and Moses coming down from Mount Sinai during the period of Exodus. And the Exodus is, of course, this significant, maybe foundational event where people who had been enslaved for centuries, almost 500 years, were now set free on a new path, a point of departure from one reality where Pharaoh is oppressing, enslaving, exploiting, to this new beginning where they are at Mount Sinai receiving a law and becoming a people. One of the problems with this story of Exodus and one of the frustrations with the Bible is that once one Pharaoh leaves, another Pharaoh emerges. And if he's not going to be Pharaoh, king of Egypt, then he might be the king of the Aramites or he might be the king of the Babylonians or then the Assyrians. But then there were also the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, on and on and on. There is always one Pharaoh ready to come and take the place of another, even to our own time with someone like Vladimir Putin, another pharaoh seeking to enslave or exploit or at least tyrannize with an unnecessary war. And so one of the questions is, are we simply bound to this cycle of history where one strong man or woman replaces another and you just hope that you roll the timeline dice and end up living in a good generation where you are not subject to the vagaries of oppression. Well, there's also a, a secondary problem, and we see this a little bit at the end of the gospel, but it's the idea that what if Pharaoh is not our biggest problem? What if there are other forces in the world that are looking to enslave and oppress human beings? And we get that with the possession of this child at the end of the gospel story today. Jesus himself expresses his annoyance and frustration that people don't quite understand what he's there to accomplish. But you can almost forgive people when they wonder, how are we supposed to deal with people like Pharaoh and with people like these demons that oppress and enslave? And if the language of demons doesn't really do it for you in the modern age, you can look at all of the effects of whatever it is, mental illness, addiction, other things that enslave human beings. And we wonder, are we simply stuck in these cycles that will not be broken? Finally, we have the problem of death. One of our neighbors uh, in our old city, he had just spent all of COVID building an outdoor barbecue and kitchen. Every week he was posting pictures. We just did this, we did that. They did a major revamping of their backyard. Two days ago he was hit on his bicycle by a motorcycle and he seemed okay. I mean, he wasn't in good shape, but he seemed okay. And yesterday he died. And so now all of this, he had just posted, we got all our new furniture furniture that won't be sat on, at least by him. They'll be sitting on it when they have his funeral. This is also the same question, are we bound and stuck into these cycles of living and dying, but ultimately just ending with a disappointing bang at the end? Well, this is why the Sunday of Transfiguration is so significant. It is the end of our epiphany journey. It is the end of our experience of seeing God manifest among us, and it started with Jesus and the Magi having those three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, indicating who he was and what he would do even then. But it wasn't necessarily clear. You could have missed them and assumed they just made a wrong turn somewhere or they made a mistake. We also had the story of the wedding at Cana, where Jesus is going to bring some new life to the party, but everyone, most of them were drunk and a lot of them missed it. So very few people realized what had happened if they noticed at all. But on this Sunday of Transfiguration, there is no missing who he is and the light that he brings. And unlike the angels who reflect light, Jesus is the light. And this is an important difference. The angels reflect his light, but he is the light. And as Amy said at the start of the service, we see him clearly for who he is. It said he was transfigured. The Greek word is he was metamorphosized. And if you think of that great novel of the 20th century called Metamorphosis, where a human being wakes up as a monstrous bug, that very famous novel by Franz Kafka, there's this idea that the human being is being transformed into something less human, a giant cockroach or whatever it was. 
the human being wakes up to discover that he's become a monster. And if you've seen any of the images from Ukraine, you see the monstrous disfiguring of human beings with the power of modern military technology. There are different parts spread in different places. And what we get here is a transfiguration that shows us a very different direction, that we were not made to be debased or disfigured or pulled apart, but we were made for this light. And this is why, how we have this remarkable encounter, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. It is as if the disciples, Peter, James, and John, end up entering a new dimension. And if you know the temple in Jerusalem, it was designed almost to be a uh, microcosm, a miniature of the heavens and the earth, so that as you pass from one to the other, you were passing from earth into heaven until finally you were in the presence of God. It was really like this trans-dimensional travel reduced to something understandable in architecture by human beings. And so it's really true that the disciples have entered into this realm where they see a new dimension where Moses, Elijah, and Jesus are all talking. And maybe you've had that desire, which is, I would love to know what God talks about when God is alone with God, or God is talking to prophets and other people of note. And today we find out. It says they were watching and Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about his departure, which doesn't sound particularly noteworthy. You know, like, don't forget, you only get two bags, 50 pounds each. If you have more than 50 pounds, you'll be charged extra when you depart. Be at the Jerusalem two hours early. You don't want to be late. The language of departure doesn't really capture what they're talking about because the word that gets used isn't so much departure. It says they were talking to Jesus about his exodus. And that gives us the key to what this all means, that God is creating a pathway to finally break the cycles of pharaohs and tyrants, whether they live in Egypt or whether they live in Russia. God is breaking this cycle of history where you just hope you end up living in a peaceful time. The ancient Greeks wondered, is history war with occasional peace or peace with occasional war? And they finally decided, at least at one point, it was war with occasional outbursts of peace. But this new exodus will be the ending of all that and the bringing of a final peace. This is the departure that Jesus brings. And it will be an exodus that isn't just setting people free from political tyranny, but is also setting people free from demonic tyranny, like this kid that he meets after, and finally from the power of death, including my neighbor who died yesterday, my old neighbor. This is what they're talking about. This is his departure, his exodus. And it says his exodus that he will accomplish in Jerusalem. And this is why the transfiguration is so important because like the first exodus, where they were finally set free after the angel of death visited and passed over their houses, now he himself will be the Passover lamb. He himself will be the blood. He himself will be the firstborn son sacrificed and he will open up a new road for us to walk, which will be the road toward Easter. Now there's this little feature that always gets brought up. Peter says Peter didn't know what he was saying. And it also said the disciples were sleepy. I think we have to give the disciples a little bit of credit. You know, like I'm not sure that they were always just tired, though they could have been. Maybe Jesus just prayed a long time and they did get tired. But it also says that they were in the presence of the glory of the Lord, which has its own weight, its own force, like centrifugal force. So you almost wonder if the blood's rushing out of their heads because the, the weight of God's presence is pushing on them. And yet they're still seeing and they're still listening and observing. And then Peter says, it is good for us to be here. Let us build three booths, three dwelling places. And I think the reason he says that is that's exactly what they did on Mount Sinai. They built three booths. In fact, they still have a festival of booths called Sukkot. The rabbi in Fountain Valley sets up a dwelling in his backyard, and for eight days they're outside uh, doing different things and remembering different stories and talking about what it means to enter the land after the Exodus. And what Peter doesn't realize is he has the wrong festival. It is not a festival for waiting. It is a festival for acting. 
This is the Passover. This is the new Exodus. If you remember the Exodus story, the Hebrews are told in their slavery, when you have the Passover meal, eat it standing up, eat it dressed, have your go bag ready. I don't know if any of you, when we had our children, they would always say, now have a bag packed by the front door so when the water breaks, you can go right to the hospital. You don't have time to pack. You know, for some of the people who are living in the path of war right now, in the Ukraine, the same thing. There isn't time now to pack. Take what you can and leave. When I was growing up in the church, there was a woman who had lived in Germany during the Second World War, and she talked about when the end of the war came, and they were trying to think, what do we save? What do we take with us when we become refugees? And she told me, and she goes, if you ever become a refugee, only take your pictures. The other stuff you can save, this you can't replace. Of course, now it's all in the cloud. She didn't have a cloud. But it was this idea of really saying so much of what you think is important isn't get an idea of what really matters. And that was her advice to me as a child at a church potluck. It's this idea you have to be ready to go. The new exodus is meant to be a time of activity, not a time of waiting, not a time of wondering. It is meant to be a time of readiness. Let's go. Let's do it. He's ready. Let's follow. And this is why the season of Lent now at LCR is meant to be a special season of discipleship and a special season of activity. This is meant to be the 40 days before Easter where you now will be called to spiritual exercise, where you will be called to support those in our community who are at risk. We do not have time to wait. We do not have time to wonder. We do not have time to say, well, let's just see what happens. It is time to be ready to go. And that's what Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus about. It is time to go. Let's go. You'll notice we'll have three sermons, at least, on the Wednesdays, Thursday or Friday of Lent. And if you haven't seen on the table outside, there's a little postcard that tells you every week of Lent where we'll be, the address will be, who's speaking, Holy Week services. It's all out there on the table, so take one of those with you so you have it. But Father Reynolds from St. Simon and Jude will be here to talk about fasting. I'll be at St. Simon and Jude to talk about giving of alms, works of mercy. Pastor Steve Wright from the Presbyterian Church will also be back here with us to talk about prayer. Those are the three disciplines of Lent. Those are the three holy activities that if you engage in them, you will be engaging in kingdom work and you will be walking the road of the new exodus. You will be participating in what it is Jesus has already accomplished as a sign, not of the world that's passing away, but of the world to come. You are an ambassador of this future and the time to go is now. If you saw in the announcements, there was a picture of Pastor Tatano in Hiroshima and with this current war and talk of possible tactical nuclear deployment, they stood in Peace Park in Hiroshima, right under where the bomb had exploded there, and they held up signs wanting to wage peace. And it is a reminder, as Jesus tells us in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers. You will be children of God. It is a reminder that in the same way that Jesus was metamorphosized on Mount Tabor, that you too have been metamorphosized through the water of baptism, not to become a monster or not to become a giant cockroach, uh, diminishing of your humanity, but rather to be a child of God, to share in this uncreated light. And when everyone leaves that mountain, the disciples are the only ones who saw who Jesus was. And they follow him now to the place of darkness, having to remember that he is the source of light. There are dark places that God will have us visit. There are hard situations that God will have us address. But we address them because we know that the source of light will be with us in the darkness. There is not time to wait. It is time for us to go. Amen. Please stand as we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Lord Jesus, on the mountain of transfiguration, you showed us the source of uncreated light, this light of heaven, this light of life. It's shown on you, on the generation of Moses, the generation of Elijah, and it shines on our faces now. Grant, O Lord, that we may not contribute to the darkness. Grant that we may not be complicit in the darkness. Grant that we might be ambassadors of your light, ambassadors of your new exodus, the breaking of the power of tyranny, the breaking of the power of death, the breaking of the power of all the forces that would enslave and hold your people from living as you made them to be, as children of God. Grant, O Lord, that as we prepare for the season of Lent, that we might be spiritual athletes, that we might go about this work of prayer and fasting and works of mercy, that our care for our neighbors, especially at-risk teens in our community, our care for them might be a sign of this new day that you have brought through your cross and through your resurrection. We pray for the nations of the world, especially nations at war. We pray for Ukraine. We pray for peace. We pray for the fever of war to be healed. We pray for new opportunities for nations to live in peace. Restrain those who are bringers of violence and unnecessary destruction. And may you make us peacemakers as you have made us your children. We pray for all of those who are living under a kind of oppression, whether it's a spiritual oppression, whether it's living under a kind of slavery of desire for those who are struggling with addiction, for those who are struggling with mental illness, for those who are living with anxiety during these times, may you come and soothe our care. May you bring your cooling spirit to refresh and renew and calm us and calm our hearts. We pray for those who are going through medical tests, for those who are wondering about their own pain, their own bodies, their own health. May you bless and keep them during anxious times and also bring strength and healing for hearts and lungs and livers and spinal cords and all the parts of us that we lift to you in our congregation today. We pray for Jane, and Mike, Mary Catherine, Mary, Inga, also the names we lift to you now silently or aloud. Almighty God, we pray for all of those who are in harm's way. We pray for all of those who are searching for the longing that is you. We pray, O oh Lord, that you fill us with courage, that we might live boldly and unabashedly in your gospel and be bearers of your good news. May we be ambassadors of hope during anxious times. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more.
That lovely refrain of that song is the perfect introduction to our celebrating of the sacrament today, for this is the inexhaustible resource that God offers the church, which is God himself, the inexhaustible mercy in which we can drown all of our trouble and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, take this cup, all of you, and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now we pray together as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the voice from heaven said, this is my son, the Messiah, listen to him. Sin, who knew no sin, that we 
we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so Let us pray. Jesus, you are the Messiah, the chosen one of God, the one chosen to make this new road for us to walk into the kingdom of heaven, into the world of your gospel, into the light of resurrection. Strengthen us with the sacrament that its grace might wash over us, the mercy might douse in us the various passions that inflame us, and that we might live freely as your people. We ask this in your name. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. 
May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his soul. wonderful week.